Here we go. Here we go. I'm David Feldman, and this is the mop up. Twitter servers crashed on Wednesday for two hours. Nobody could access the social media giant. Twitter knew something was terribly wrong when women, people of color, and members of the LGBTQ community all over the world felt safe. According to the newly released transcripts from the January 6th committee, in the final days of the Trump administration, Mark Meadows, Donald Trump's chief of staff, burnt government documents in his office fireplace. Surprised he found any with Trump using them all as toilet paper. It's a little two-year-old kid. Trump was flushing government documents down the, uh, down the toilet. That's, I did that when I was two. More lies from newly elected Republican Congressman George Santos of New York. Turns out, His mother didn't die on 9-11. He didn't attend Horace Mann, the elite New York private school. He didn't graduate from college. He didn't work for Citigroup, didn't attend a Goldman Sachs conference and berate the company for not investing in renewable energy. He's not Jewish. His grandmother didn't survive the Holocaust. He never ran an animal charity, never lost an employee at the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando. Despite claiming he has a husband, there's no record of his ever being married to a man. Although he can open beer cans by shooting laser beams from his eyes. That is true. I didn't believe it, but I've seen the video and... George Santos can open beer cans by shooting laser beams from his eyes. Federal prosecutors, as well as prosecutors in Long Island, New York, have opened investigations into Santos, while Republicans grapple with the question of whether Santos is unfit to hold elective office or too fit to be only a congressman. I mean, the way this guy plays fast and loose with the truth, I'm surprised the Freedom Caucus isn't trying to run him against Kevin McCarthy for speaker. Santos is scheduled to be sworn in on Tuesday when the new Republican-controlled 118th Congress convenes. There is talk he could face an ethics investigation The Republicans are going to be in charge of the House. There will be no ethics investigation because there will be no ethics. Does anyone think they're going to bother with George Santos? The January 6th committee just wrapped up its investigation and recommended that the new House Ethics Committee sanction Republican Congressman Jim Jordan, Kevin McCarthy, Scott Perry, and Andy Biggs for the role they played in trying to overthrow the government of the United States on January 6th. And you know that ethics investigation is never going to take place. So does anyone think Republicans are going to go after George Santos for lying about some animal charity he claims he founded? Yes. Yes, Yes and yes. Of course, of course, they're going to crucify George Santos. He will be the sacrificial lamb for all the Republican sins. He's the patsy. George Santos is a 34-year-old deeply troubled con artist who perpetrated a perpetrated, perpetrated, (laughs) perpetrated a fraud, perpetrated a fraud on the American people. And since it's not the kind of fraud that made money for anyone, Republicans will be more than willing to throw him under the bus, assuming, assuming George Santos can be replaced by another Republican. They do have a slim majority. They can't lose him. So if they can replace George Santos with a more skilled prevaricator, the GOP will grab the low-hanging fruit, George Santos, and make it look like we Republicans care about restoring trust in our elected officials. 
Now, I don't have any sympathy for George Santos. I kind of like him. In a way, his lies, his lies are heroic in their depth and consistency. And maybe I'm wrong, but since he ran as a Republican, isn't conning voters pretty much what he's supposed to do? The whole Republican thing is a con. Their entire platform is built on a con, uh, you know, lowering taxes for the wealthy stimulates the economy. That's a con. The richest one percent are job creators. Con. The idea that inflation is caused by government spending on a social safety net. That's a con. Medicare is inefficient, and the only way to deliver the best health care to the most people is through private insurance. All one big con job. Guns keep us safe. That's a lie. It's a con. Even Republicans on the social issues, it's all one big con job. They claim to be the party of Christians, but they're so busy turning their backs on the poor and getting rich doing so, Jesus would send them right to hell. It's all a con. They're not against abortion for themselves, at least. They're not against abortion. They don't believe in family values because they have no values. The entire Republican Party is a con. And the bedrock of this con, the Manhattan schist that props it all up, is the lie. The lie. The Washington Post counted nearly 41,000 lies told by Donald Trump during the four years he was president. And yes, I know Joe Biden keeps lying about getting arrested trying to meet Nelson Mandela in South Africa. He keeps lying about getting arrested in the 60s at civil rights marches. I know Joe Biden never kept his promise to raise the minimum wage or introduce a public option alongside Obamacare. I get that. I get that. But the Democrats do have politicians, senators, and Congress people who don't lie. The entire Republican Party, on the other hand, is nothing but liars who offer only hatred and greed. They detest government because they despise the American people. But they can't say that, so they lie. The only reason Republicans go to Washington is to lower taxes for the wealthy and destroy the administrative state so nobody in the government will ever cost rich people any money. Republicans pretend to be for things that don't exist, like the family or patriotism or morality. But they believe in none of that. How could you? None of that exists. Their entire existence is built on money and power. And to get all that, they must lie to the American people, each other and themselves. Their job is to rile people up, get voters angry, get them to hate, get them to hate everyone but the richest one percent. That's the job of Republican. Get people angry at everybody but the richest one percent. Distract us all with hatred so the rich can get richer. So, yeah, George Santos, he's going down because Republicans need to set an example that nobody is above the law. Congressmen aiding and abetting an insurrection, that we can live with. It's an honest mistake. But George Santos fabricate, fabricating his past? No, we, we must set an example. We need to show the American people that nobody is above the law. Unless, of course, you write the law or interpret the law or are expected to enforce the law, in which case none of those laws apply to you. If we learned anything from the January 6 hearings, it's that Republicans will say whatever it takes to remain in power. 
They claimed fraud at the polls in 2020. But nearly 60 judges asked Donald Trump's lawyers, specifically Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell, they were asked for concrete evidence for fraud. And 60 times in 60 trials, Trump's lawyers were unable to provide a single, and I mean a single shred of evidence of voter fraud. They could not, in a court of law, in 60 courts of law, Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani could not present a single shred of evidence of voter fraud. That one, not a single shred. From Election Day 2020 until January 6, Trump's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, insisted that the election was stolen by Biden people tampering with Dominion voting machines. Rudy Giuliani claimed foreign governments tampered with Dominion voting machines to get Biden elected. But according to his testimony before the January 6th committee, if you read the transcripts that have just been released, he never believed, he said to the January 6th committee that he never believed for a second that any of that was true. Rudy Giuliani admitted to the January 6th committee that he says things outside a courtroom that he would never say in a court of law. On the steps outside of the courtroom, he would lie to the media. But when pressed by a judge or by the January 6th committee, he would admit he didn't believe a single word he was saying on Fox News or during his press conferences. According to the January 6th report, Rudy Giuliani said he did not believe that Dominion voting machines stole the election for Joe Biden. He also testified that there was no evidence, not a single shred of evidence, that foreign countries had interfered in the election or manipulated votes. But that didn't stop him from holding press conference after press conference, going on Fox News, going on his radio show and spreading these lies, which he continues to do to this day. As long as you don't make him swear on a Bible, he will lie about the election of 2020. Sidney Powell Trump's lead attorney on the voter fraud case in 2020, she was the one who pushed hardest on the idea that Dominion tampered with their voting machines in 2020 to push Biden over the top. She, like Giuliani, was unable to provide a single shred of evidence or an expert that could even suggest that the voting machines had been tampered with. Now, Dominion is suing Sidney Powell, as well as Fox News, and Rudy Giuliani for defamation. And in sworn testimony, Sidney Powell said, and I quote, she was deposed for this defamation case. Uh, you know, she's the one who came up with the idea that Dominion voting machines had been hacked for Biden during her uh, deposition, she said, and I quote, no reasonable person would conclude that my statements were truly statements of fact. Under oath, they say something different. Sidney Powell said, under oath, no reasonable person would conclude that my statements were truly statements of fact. So why the press conferences? Why say it over and over to convince the mob it's true? Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani weren't playing to the judges, to the courtrooms. They were playing to the court of public opinion. They were trying to incite the mob and the mob the mob still believes this to be true. 
they still believe the election was stolen. And no amount of court testimony where Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani admit that they lied about the, le- the election, no amount of testimony before the January 6th committee where they admit that they lied to the mob about the 2020 election, no amount of testimony is going to change the mob's mind. And that's exactly how January 6th happened. Rudy Giuliani, alcoholic, alcoholic. Rudy Giuliani, did I mention he's an alcoholic? Rudy Giuliani, a broken down alcoholic, didn't care about our courts. He was Trump's lead attorney after the election, right? He did not care about the courts. He was always playing to the mob outside the courtroom. It's why on January 6th, after 60 60 judges threw his cases out, on January 6th, speaking to the mob on the ellipse, he said, he shouted, and I quote, let's have trial by combat. Let's have trial by combat. Because he knew there would never be a real trial. Every single trial he brought was thrown out of court. So he screamed, let's have trial by combat. He knew what he was doing. Sidney Powell knew what she was doing. Donald Trump knew what he was doing. They were inciting a mob to take control of the Capitol. They weren't depending on our courts or our laws. They were depending on the mob. On the mob. That's what they do. And you lie to the mob. You tell the mob to believe whatever you want the mob to believe. Something happened. Maybe when they got rid of the fairness doctrine, but something happened where facts no longer matter. Where there are lies, democracy dies. Where there are lies, democracy dies. In America, we have two versions of what happened. We have the truth and the Republican Party's side of the story. But thankfully, it's still against the law to lie under oath. And witnesses who swear on the Bible have two choices here in America, either tell the truth or plead the fifth. Rudy Giuliani told the truth under oath. Rudy tells the truth. Sidney Powell under oath told the truth. And believe it or not, Sean Hannity finally told the truth. We had a, we had a, swear him in on the Bible, but he finally got around to telling the truth. He had to testify. He was deposed. Sean Hannity and his cohorts over at Fox News are getting sued for $1.6 billion by Dominion Voting Systems for defamation. This is going to be a big trial. And they cleaned house before the trial started, like Lou Dobbs, who was really pushing the Dominion voting machines lie on Fox. He got canned. Uh, This is a big case. This case is as big as the Roger Ailes rape accusations that turned out to be true. I mean, let's not forget Fox News was run by Roger Ailes, invented by Roger Ailes, who was a rapist. So there is this $1.6 billion defamation lawsuit that's proceeding against Fox News. The trial starts, I think, in March, April of next year. And right now is the discovery phase of this lawsuit. A lawsuit which contends that Fox News, its on-air personalities and top executives, knowingly spread lies that Dominion's voting machines had been altered to throw the 2020 presidential election for Joe Biden. 
Again, this trial is in its preliminary stages. But new testimony from Sean Hannity's deposition has been leaked. And it's not good. Not good for Sean Hannity. Not good for Fox News. Hannity, until the defamation suit had been filed, Hannity would often ask how Democrats got away with silencing all those supposed Election Day whistleblowers who could expose the role that Dominion voting machines played in throwing the election for Joe Biden. This was something Sean Hannity kept repeating over and over again. That is why viewers of Fox News take it as received wisdom that Democrats using Dominion voting machines were able to fix the election. It's all a lie, repeated incessantly by Fox News, by Sean Hannity. They repeated this lie despite almost 60 lawsuits challenging the election returns, 60 lawsuits filed by Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani, 60 lawsuits in the lead up to January 6th getting thrown out of court. They were thrown out of court because there's not a single shred of evidence that there were any voting inconsistencies in any state which is why one of the ringleaders of the Stop the Steal conspiracy, Rudy Giuliani, is facing disbarment proceedings in Washington, D.C. He's lost his law license. It's been suspended in New York City. It's why Sidney Powell, the other ringleader of the Stop the Steal conspiracy, is also facing sanctions and disbarment from the Texas bar. But... You wouldn't know any of this if you were watching Fox News. During testimony leaked last week, Sean Hannity, we've learned during testimony in the Dominion voting machine defamation suit, Hannity was asked point blank if he believed what he said. Did you or did you not believe that the Democratic Party was silencing whistleblowers who could expose Dominion voting machine irregularities, irregularities that favored Joe Biden. Did you believe that? Under oath, Sean Hannity answered, and I quote, I did not believe it for one second, unquote. Sean Hannity was asked, you kept repeating that Dominion voting machines had been hacked to favor Joe Biden. Did you believe that? And Sean Hannity answered, quote, I did not believe it for one second. Be nice to have Fox News anchors deliver the news under oath, wouldn't it? I think it would look a little different. I think it would be a little different. There is the truth, and then there is what is said on conservative media like Fox News. Lawyers for Dominion Voting Machines are making the case publicly that depositions taken from Fox News employees like Tucker Carlson, these depositions reveal that practically nobody working for Fox News ever believed voting machines had been hacked in 2020. And yet Tucker Carlson, Sean Hannity, along with several other high profile Fox News personalities, continued up until litigation began to repeat this baseless claim as fact. Lawyers for Dominion Voting are now saying that when asked under oath, not a single Fox News employee could present a single shred of evidence that the Dominion voting machines had been hacked or that votes had been altered in any way to favor Joe Biden. And yet Fox News continued to repeat that lie over and over and over, right up until the defamation lawsuit was filed. Which is why, according to the Pointer Institute, poll after poll shows that to this day, Nearly 70% of all Republican voters still believe Joe Biden is an illegitimate president who
who stole the presidency from Donald Trump. And bold lies result in bold acts, like storming the Capitol on January 6th. And that was the entire purpose. That was the entire purpose of those lies. They knew, they knew those lies would never hold up in court. Sidney Powell, Rudy Giuliani, Donald Trump, they knew, but they knew it would animate the mob. Dominion is suing Fox for defamation. They're suing Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell for defamation. But the big lie that the election was stolen is still very much alive. And as we read and digest the January 6th committee's official eight-chapter report on what really happened leading up and during the insurrection, leading up to and during the insurrection, we are learning just how close America came on January 6th to witnessing a bloodbath, a real bloodbath, A bloodbath that Donald Trump not only orchestrated starting before the election, a bloodbath that he was disappointed didn't go far enough. And it was all lies, all lies that they knew were lies. Everyone was in on it. Everyone was in on it. They all lied to the mob. More lies than George Santos could have ever imagined and way more dangerous lies. Trump, Fox News, Sean Hannity, and pretty much the entire Republican Party lies with abandon because they assume they will never get caught. Chief of Staff Mark Meadows had an assistant whose name is Cassidy Hutchinson. And when she was brought before the January 6th committee, she, unlike Mark Meadows, had the courage to obey the subpoena. CNN reports, I'm sure you all have read this, that Cassidy Hutchinson was initially provided an attorney by Donald Trump. That attorney's name is Stefan Passantino, who previously worked in the Trump administration as their ethics attorney. Uh, hmm, ethics. <laughs> CNN is reporting, and I'm sure you've all read this, that Stefan Passantino, the lawyer provided by Donald Trump before Cassidy Hutchinson was going to testify before the January 6th committee, uh, lawyer Stefan Passantino advised Cassidy Hutchinson to lie before the January 6th committee, say things like, I can't recall. I I saw things, but I can't remember. This was the free legal advice Donald Trump down in Mar-a-Lago was providing to his former employees. This was the free lawyer that he offered to Cassidy Hutchinson. By the way, those lawyers that Donald Trump provides They're all paid for by his super PACs. When you donate to a Trump super PAC, you are essentially paying his legal fees as well as legal fees for any Trump subordinate who will refuse to cooperate with the January 6th committee or the Justice Department. Okay? Now, in the committee's final report, they say their work was hindered by the Trump administration illegally engaging in witness tampering. This is beyond anything we saw during Watergate. Before testifying before the January 6th committee, multiple witnesses said they received calls from Trump and his associates advising them to remain silent. This is Gambino family stuff. The report says the Justice Department is now aware of Donald Trump's attempts to tamper with witnesses' testimony. There are, 
roughly 2.5 million Americans behind bars tonight. Most of them never had a trial. Most of them are poor. And so they plead guilty for a lighter sentence. They don't get a trial. The wrong people are in jail tonight. I'm pretty certain we could empty out pretty much all of our prisons and safely fill them with the real criminals, the real criminals, not the stick up artists on the street, but the people who mug us every day on Wall Street, stealing our jobs, our pensions, our homes, our health care, our education and our democracy. We need to lock up the people who own our judges, our Justice Department, our government, and both political parties. George Santos isn't the liar. He's not the scandal. The scandal is Donald Trump still walking free. Why? I'm David Feldman. Remember to stay strong and protect the weak. Uh, before I bring the Hershenfelds on, Dr. Uh, Dr. Philip Hershenfeld is a Freudian uh, psychoanalyst, a real psychiatrist, real. And Ethan Hershenfeld is the author of Today Is Now, Dr. Samuel Benjamin is his alter ego. Go by Today Is Now. It is an hysterical book and it has the Feldman guarantee. I have a confession to make. Uh-oh. OK, there, there are a couple of things that I have said in the past year that are not true. I, I did not attend Horace Mann. I didn't work for Goldman Sachs or Citigroup. I'm not Jewish. My grand well, did go to Baruch College. <laughs> <laughs> of all the cockamamie things to make up, who would make up going to Baruch College? My God, that's how you know this guy's a real numbskull. Make up Stanford, make up, I don't know, Bowdoin, but you're going to make up Baruch? Don't make up that you went to any college where the name ends with a ch. It's not getting you anywhere. But wait, it might have gotten somewhere in his neighborhood where he was running in Long Island. Right. Yeah. We're into chaz, <laughs> the chaz, the chaz. Yeah, but he could have said yeshiva. He could have said he went but, to Bar Ilan. He went to yeah. some, I mean, Baruch. <laughs> so we're talking about Congressman George Santos, January yeah. 3rd. Unless prosecutors move swiftly, he's going to be the new congressperson from Long Island. He purports to be gay. He said he had a husband, but he was married to a woman. He says he made seven hundred thousand dollars a year investing people's money. He had an animal charity. He said the, the I think the biggest crime he's committed is saying that his mother died a 9-11. That's right. that. So what you're a, a Freudian psychiatrist. Yeah. Why do why why do we believe these lies before we talk about? Yes. Why somebody well, lies? Why would we just accept this so blindly and wait till he's elected to find people, out? People love a good story more than anything else. It turns out some little newspaper in Long Island broke this story. I just read this. Months ago, and nobody paid any attention to them because people like to hear the story. They like to imagine themselves in his place, perhaps, or they like the idea that that somebody um, has persevered through adversity, like... um, a Dickens hero, David Copperfield, for example. So it took the yeah. New York it took the New York Times to to take right. the story that had already been covered 
and people say, oh, now it's a scandal. It wasn't a scandal when the small little newspaper was reporting it, but now it's a scandal because the New York Times says so. Ethan Hershenfeld, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Hi, I'm Ethan. Hello, hello, David. Hello, Dr. Author of Today Is Now. Um, I, two funny things that a friend of mine, uh, we were talking about this today. And he, point, he pointed out that this guy didn't just lie about a lot of stuff. He lied about every single thing. <laughs> you go through, it's the school. It's the college. It's the job. It's the second job. It's where he lived. It's his criminal record. It's his mother. It's his religion. It's his sexuality. It's his, he lied about every, it's impressive. It's, it's he's just comprehensive. Man. You got it. I mean, you got to give it to the guy. He really, he's, he's, uh, he's thorough. We know that about him. He's thorough. He lied about every single thing. George, joke, he's which, George Thoroughbad. Right. The other thing I heard um, from a, another friend, uh, I'll give him credit, a friend, uh, Elliot, apparently he said, yeah, if that guy can claim he worked for Citibank and Goldman Sachs, I can claim that I work for Whole Foods and Pampers. <laughs> You know, because that was his his explanation for working for those companies. He did kind of did business next to them. All right. So we'll get to the pathology of George Santos in a second. But let's talk about the pathology of the voter and of America, because we've talked about this. There's a distinct possibility, especially coming from New York, the New York City area. He's he's he could end up becoming a folk hero. Why do we. Is it an American trait that we kind of like him for this? We, the huckster, the, the reinvention of oneself. This isn't he a real American? One way of looking at it. Uh, you know, P.T. Barnum, sucker born every minute. And, and also, I think uh, there was probably so much more of this that went on in the pre-photographic age and then the pre-digital age mm -hmm. it was very easy to <laughs> right. just move to a new town and then you could like you know shawshank redemption your way into you all you need is a signed document no photo you just walk in right. put on a nice suit and then you're whoever the hell you want to be it's so, got much harder to do that so his lies reveal a lot about himself not the fact that he's a liar but what he the stories he chose, Doctor, they're almost as as you said, they're aspirational. You can almost say, "Well, I kind of like the lies. It's it's who he wants to be. It's kind of his. This is his alter ego, his better self that he's presenting. We all try to do that. We just don't get caught. What's not to like? There isn't anything in there that's he didn't. Everything he lied about, at least." I find appealing. He ran an animal shelter. He's right. tasted eviction and debt and right. Yeah. There was a story online today about a, a Republican congressman who did this in the 1950s. And he told this gigantic story about his heroics during the Second World War, resisting torture, capturing a uh, German scientist, which made it impossible for the Germans to invent a uh, nuclear bomb. It went on and on and on. And there was one thing true about his whole story, which was he did step on a landmine and was badly injured and and met his wife during his rehab. Everything else was total fantasy. And this is an answer to your question. There are certain people whose sense of reality is not that firm. And they start fantasizing stuff. And after a while, and especially after they've said it out loud, they begin to incorporate it as part of their identity. This guy in the 50s, he came home from the war, badly injured, eventually learned how to walk. And he started talking at church groups. 
And he just added and added and added to the stories because he felt so good. All the adulation he was getting. So I, I really think after a while, people like this aren't that clear. Mm -hmm. That seems, I think. That, well, let me ask, that. let me ask uh, Dr. Samuel Benjamin or his alter ego, <laughs> Ethan as, Hershenfeld. As a made up, a made up person. What I'm hearing from your esteemed you colleague. Be, you should be an expert on this. Uh -huh, your esteemed colleague, the real Dr. Hershenfeld, is talking about trauma. How is trauma pronounced? Well, the, the, those guys say trauma. Mm -hmm. So you can tell that they're the actual. So you lie. Would you say that people lie because of a tr trauma like World War Two, stepping on a landmine, that there's some kind of. Something happened to George Santos, some emotional landmine that he stepped the on. The emotional landmine for George so for George Santos is that he was not born George Soros. That's what he's really <laughs> upset about. <laughs> He just wants to be sore. So he's invented the European roots, the high finance, the charitable works. Uh, the head, yeah, no. Um, Why do people lie? Is, is, is there a try you're reinventing? It, it can be one of two things. <laughs> like I just stated with, auth with absolute authority. Uh -huh. It can be one of two things. The, the lie can be to cover up a painful truth, which could be a trauma. It could also be to cover up an emptiness, mm. to fill a hole. Wow. Yeah. And I have the feeling that in the, in the case of this uh, Santos, it's more of the latter. By the way, for anyone who doesn't know what that means, that means the second of the two <laughs> things that I was talking about. <laughs> Some people are confused by that. When someone says a ladder, someone thinks someone's working on a roof suddenly. This has nothing to do with that. There's no roofing. There's no electrician. It's just that I said two things, and I want you to know I'm now talking about the second of those things. That's the ladder. Do not be confused, okay? One of these two people is an actual psychiatrist. <laughs> Which one is it? What do you think? The ladder. <laughs> the, la the, the ladder. ladder. <laughs> Well, I you thought can, that was pretty, that was pretty good, Doctor Hershenfeld, wasn't it? I thought it was great. Let yeah. me let me throw in another little pearl about all this. By the way, if the ladder is not actually genetically related to you, that's known as a step ladder. <laughs> go, go on, doctor, please. The first lie that a little child tells is in fact a, an important developmental milestone. Because That's right. It shows the development of the ego to a sufficient degree that the child knows that the parent and the child are not one and the same. See? 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 I told you this guy was the real deal. <laughs> yeah. Explain that. Uh, I, I just got the chills. Well, that was so good. If you, if you think about, if you think about, think back to the womb. Yeah. And think, think it's, there's no distinction between you, the fetal Feldman. And, and, and <laughs> that was the name. Mama. That was the name before we got to Ellis Island. We were the fetal Feldmans. We were very small, undeveloped. And we were the fetal. And we Feldmans. never got seasick. And we never got seasick. <laughs> No, until the, and then after when the child is then born and put right on the mama's breast and spends all that time, the child has no sense of being anything but part of this bigger organism, this big, warm, fleshy, milk bearing organism. And then with a little more neurons developing and a little more consciousness. Yeah, consciousness. There starts to be a sense of, wait a second, maybe we're two different organisms. So as the doctor said, the ability. Yeah, go ahead. And the, and and the recognition that I can have something in my mind that this other person doesn't know about. That's the developmental advance. And what age does that usually happen? 
I'd have to consult with my colleagues who study this, but my guess, this is only a guess. 18 months. <laughs> That's a very good guess, but I would say a little late. I would say a little later, but you may be right. It's, a great it's not a guess. It's based on my research. <laughs> oh, okay. So. This is, ba- this is ba- eight, at 18 months, the, the child learns to lie. Now, do you have to be taught to lie or do you develop that innately? You, it's a self-protective me- um, mechanism. Did you eat that cookie? No. <laughs> so at 18 months. Uh, and what is the proper response when, when a child lies, like when baby tells its first lie? You write it you down should, in a book. Um, shake. You should shake. No, 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 no. no that is never the proper. No, it's response. not. No, no. So the baby tells its first lie. The parent is, I would assume, proud, like they're shocked. No, they're not proud because they're not thinking about this as a developmental milestone. Um, they're thinking, this kid just lied to me. But if they're not harsh, if they're not rigid, if they're not punitive, they can find a, a, um, a better way to deal with it. Um, also, a, a, a bright lamp <laughs> in the face of a baby. <laughs> that can be very effective because the baby's very small and very the skin is thin. We have ways to make you talk. I, yeah. I don't talk yet. We have ways to make 18 months. They should be talking. So would you say um, some, somebody like Bernie Madoff uh, and George Santos, that their trauma comes from how their parents might have responded to their very first lie? No. In the movies, that's how. it would OK, work. right. Much more complex than that. It has to do with, of course, it has to do with how they were brought up. It has to do with how their parents behaved, because identification is a, a, you know, a very powerful driver of personality development. So you, if you have parents who are basically truthful, you're much more likely to end up truthful. If you have parents who lie all the time, you're much more likely to end up as, as, as a liar or being able to use lies right. convincingly. It's funny. You mentioned Madoff, and I'm thinking about how he got into that mess. It seems to me like that was a guy who didn't set out to lie. He just set out incredibly greedy, and he started covering his ass with, with that, those Ponzi maneuvers, and then he got into it too deep. It seems to me like Santos, it's different. He wasn't, he wasn't, I don't know that he was motivated by greed and that he was, it's, somehow it doesn't seem like he got into it stepwise. It just seems like a really, like a real psychopath. This, the, the, the fact that he made everything up about himself. Now, um, if your universe but, is big enough, you can be an inveterate, a compulsive liar and go for years without getting exposed. I, I think in, in Hollywood that you can be a there's a famous book that the title was Hello, He Lied <laughs> instead of Hello, He Said Hello, He Lied that. And I, I would assume that this is how it is in other businesses. But I know that in television there are executives, agents, and managers who are uh, who just lie, and they're good at it, and they're creative, and you want them to represent you. That that, and I've heard that there are big name directors and producers who are who don't need to lie, but will go to Meryl Streep and say, uh, "We've we already have." Aaron Sorkin writing this movie. He's already attached. They attach people to these projects when those people aren't attached. And these are like big name directors or producers who do that. 
Uh, Donald Trump wanted to go into the movie business. That was his original dream. And Fred Trump said, no, you're going to you're taking over my business. Had Donald Trump kept true to his dream. Yeah. We'd have nothing to talk about right now. He would have been great Uh, in Hollywood, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He probably would have made schlock, but he maybe he would have made hit hit schlock. Yeah. Um, I'm reminded of one of the one of the constituents for Santos who was defending him said, yeah, everybody pads their resumes. Right. Everybody pads. Everybody makes up their resumes. That was a shocking defense of this guy, because, first of all, no, not everyone does. And it's the people who do. Maybe they just exaggerate. But that was a guy who could not admit that he had been duped. Oh, explain That's, explain that to me, please. What do you mean by that? Means this guy was a supporter of him, and and now that the truth has come out, he has to say, "Well, no, he's, he's a fine congressman. Um, no big deal." So there's an there the the voter or this guy's. Ego is at stake now that, that he feels yeah. inferior because he didn't he feels. Yeah, yeah. There, there are some people who are unable to say I made a mistake or I am tricked. In this case, it doesn't really even take that much of an admission of making a mistake. The person lied to you and there's yeah. no reason not to believe them. It's just that it's there is a I, I did see some people quoted as saying, you know, this guy tricked me. He doesn't have my vote now and he shouldn't be representing me. I think there are a lot of people in that camp, but there 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 are a number, like you said, who, uh, yeah, they're going to stand by the guy. And the the bigger the lie, the more they double down and triple down on that person. Like with Trump, the worse it gets for Trump, the more you expose this guy, the more his diehard supporters believe in him. And by the way, the. Um Hollywood um, director who you were quoting, who said, yeah, yeah, all sorts of people attached to this movie. He may be just operating under the assumption that, yeah, this is how this business is done. I'm not telling a lie. This is how we do it. Mm -hmm. Ethan, you were going to say something because I was going to. Oh, no, no, no. I remember when I was living in San Francisco I got hired to write on Roseanne and it was a big thing for a a young comic, not so young, but to leave, you know, be flown down to San Francisco to work on Roseanne because San Francisco is kind of a small town. It's not Hollywood. And I came back while I was working on Roseanne to do stand up. And I was in the they had a little dressing room in the comedy club and some comics came in and go, what are you doing in San Francisco? And I said, oh, Francis Ford Coppola flew me up. He's thinking of doing Godfather 4. Mario Puzo can't do it, so I'm going to take a a stab at it. And they went, wow, really? I went, no. (laughs) No. And I went, oh, my God. You can lie. And people, it was like baby's first lie. And I thought, what would happen if I told one lie every day? Where would my career be if I had a very disciplined rollout every day of a of one lie that can't be proven? Like, how are you going to prove that Francis Ford Coppola isn't? I think that that's the kind of approach you need, the kind of disciplined approach you need to become a really good liar. One a day. Just develop that skill. And then the lie does all the work for you because people gossip. And then you just go, I don't want to talk about it. And the less you want to talk about your lie, the more people are going to keep perseverating it. But this is related to the people who say, I can't lie because I don't have a good enough memory. Meaning that you know, if you tell lies, you really got to remember what they were. Well, that was the interesting thing with that Santos with his mo- saying that his mother died on on 9-11 or died from 
So uh, someone just turned up two of his tweets. They were five years apart, one of which uh, said that she died from 9-11. And then the other one said she died in 2016. So well, in his defense, he, just, he forgot. He forgot. All of us died a little on 9-11. So, okay. you know, the, the Jewish. <laughs> what? Very philosophical of you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So the year is coming to an end. What what did you learn this year? I'm mean, in all seriousness. This was a tough year for everybody, as was 2021. And what do you know now that you didn't know a year from now? You know, what I learned this year that I did not know last year was Portuguese. <laughs> Have you been studying? How about you? How about you guys? No, no, I don't. I don't know oh. Portuguese, and I didn't. Yeah. Do you do better on even or odd number years? I, I always easy. think that even number years for me are learning years, hmm. and uh, odd number years are where I forget what I learned. <laughs> what do you prefer? Okay. I learned, here's what I learned. I'm going to attempt for the remaining years of my life to get in touch a little bit more. I, as I probably mentioned on the show before, I'm an atheist. I'm not a believer. But I'm trying to get in touch with, and I don't like the word spiritual, but I'm trying to get in touch with the idea that there's something deeper or higher than all the stuff we're chasing after and arguing about day in and day out. I don't know that there is anything else, but I'm I'm committed to trying to find that out. Would you say everything we want is wrong? Everything, right? As a Buddhist, would you say? Oh, everything? no, no, I can't claim. I, 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 I uh, as a nudist. <laughs> I want her. I want him. I want her. That's all. Yeah. No. Um, you know what might help you in that in that quest? Tell me. Study the pictures that are coming back from Hubble. Those amazing pictures of what this universe uh -huh. looks like. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that that will lead to some kind of belief. Yeah. But but I think it's... Um, yeah, I'm not looking for belief. That's not exactly yeah. what I'm looking for. But yeah, that's a good idea. It makes you think. Yeah. I did hear someone talking about... Exactly. That's what I heard someone talking about recently. Who I, I, it's this Eckhart Tolle, who I really like listening to his talks. And he was talking about space. He's always talking about inner spaciousness as the... the this, this, uh, the thing to, to hook into and that really looking up at the sky or considering space is actually a kind of gateway into that, that, that feeling or that idea that you have these vast, these vast distances between anything. Most of what it is out there is just nothing. Mm -hmm. Especially this one photo, which they call the pillars of creation which are these two gigantic, very colorful pillars of, it's apparently dust and interstellar stuff, and it's where stars are created. Hmm. And you look at that thing and say, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So what percentage of your average person, somebody like me, an average person. We're what? not an average person, but anyway. All right, below average. Okay. On a given day, what percentage of my thoughts are meaningless? Like the things that I'm brooding about. I, I went for my long walk today and I was ruminating and chewing on things. And uh, So what was the question? What percentage of those thoughts what are what? Are worthless. 
Oh, a hundred percent. Thank you. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's, that's actually, that's right to the, that's right to the, to the heart of the matter with this, this Eckhart Tolle approach to, to thinking about your, your life. It's exactly that, that all of the mental noise we spend our entire lives up here with all this chatter going on and the, the place to try to go is to the space between the thoughts. And the what is, is is not your friend. Yeah. What is the space between our thoughts? What is that? Uh, I don't I haven't found that out yet, but I'm, <laughs> I'm committed to finding it out. No, it's a it's a place of um, as he describes it. I don't want to misquote, but it's it's alert, non thinking, spacious awareness. It's just a state of being aware and being conscious without all of the, oh, what do I got to do? What did I do? Why did I do that? Why did she do that to me? Right. I, which is, I mean, we really do spend 99% of the time with all of those. And they call it the monkey mind in, in Buddhism. Um, I, and I, I would add to that. I'm, I'm not detracting from it. But I, I would add to it. Loving other people and beings and the world. What do you and do? That, yeah. Wait, sorry, what was that the answer to? Important thoughts. Oh, oh right. Oh, the, right. I don't know that those are thoughts exactly, but for sure. Those are yeah. feelings. Yeah. 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 Right. So when I'm on my walk, I, I walk to 53rd Street today. I walk to a specific office building. I had a, a MacGuffin, a goal that I had to get to. I wanted to look... There's a there's an office building. The secret isn't that the, isn't that the Madoff building, Fifty Third Street, the Lipstick Building. The Lipstick Building. No, yeah. but is that, was it on Fifty Third? I think <clears throat> uh, there's an office building that I walk to, and I always check who works there. And over the years, I've noticed fewer and fewer people work. It's the Seagram Building, the beautiful Seagram. I always walk in. I love the smell of the Seagram Building. And I walk in there, I always check what kind of companies are there. And when, you know, 20 years ago, when I would check it out, there'd be advertising agencies and magazines and newspaper syndicates. Now the Seagram building, it's just uh, the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund, the Bankman Family Foundation. And I spoke to the guy in the lobby. I said, this place is empty. He goes, oh, yeah, it's been empty for years, even before COVID. I said, Nobody lit. Nobody works. here. Nah, nobody works here. It's just empty office space. And and I was it's it proves to me that New York City is just a shell game. It's just a lie that these buildings are empty. And if if they if prices were truly set by supply and demand, you could get uh, a, a four bedroom apartment in New York City. You could rent a four bedroom apartment in New York City for like twelve hundred dollars a month. It was just pure supply and demand. But something else is propping up this economy. I don't know what that has to do with Eckerd Toll, but that fueled yes. my walk. That rage fueled me. Um what wasn't there a fancy restaurant in the lobby? The four there? seasons. That, that's what was there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but that's gone, right? Yeah, you go. Henry Kissinger would be eating there oh. with Diane Sawyer. That was all. Now there's a move to turn those into apartments. That's like the idea. Could we turn all these offices into apartments? Right. That would be a cool place to have an apartment, I guess. Yeah, something like forty percent of office space is empty in New York City. I don't. I don't see how it comes back, and I don't understand why. There hasn't been just this crash in in what what is propping up real estate prices. Does Eckhart Tolle have an answer to that? <laughs> what? Anyway, what, what do you um, levitation? How about that? <laughs> Levit. That was the original name that Levitt wanted to call yes. Levittown. Levitt. What are you reading, Doctor? The real Doctor. Let me tell you a, uh, a little bit of a coincidence from our discussion tonight. It was my birthday the other day. Mazel tov. And we didn't want to go into a restaurant, so we took out 
from a very nice Italian restaurant near us where Bernie Madoff had a regular table every night. Hmm. Now he has a regular table somewhere else. Mm hmm. And the name of that restaurant is Le Pyramide, I believe. Uh, Primola. Primo. I bet. Primola. I bet if you met, I heard that if you met Bernie Madoff, he smelled good. He was cuddly, and you you wanted to touch him. That's what I was told. That he there was something magnetic about him. That you just that there was something very avuncular and. There would have to be for him to be able to pull this off. Yeah. Um, yeah, people wanted to touch his money also. That was the main that was thing. the affinity scam, right? You where you rip off people of your own ilk yes, right. as opposed to. But, but in answer to your question, I am listening to a book I've read twice before, which I really love. Great Expectations by Charlie Dickens. Charlie Dickens. Great Expectations. Yes, I really, I really love it. Well, you know, you've built it up twice. Now I'm going to read it. I'm going to be disappointed. You built up all my. Okay. All my, what do you? Um, I am rereading something I read many years ago, which is the uh, the Garcia Marquez novel, A Hundred Years of Solitude, which I am enjoying again. And it's been so long since I read it that I, my memories of it are really, really faint. So it's nice. It's like reading it for the first time. I found myself reading this week for long stretches of time. I, nice. I, I gave up. Like there was a part of me where I just said, I give up. Uh, I, I'm not going to fight anymore with the world. Uh, and I just read and I was very happy. Great. So I think the secret Great. to reading is just giving up. Yeah, well, certainly it's giving up reading. For me, it's giving up the news. It's just turning my phone off. Then I can pick up the book. Do dogs lie? I know sheep lie. A lot of sheep have lied about my past. But do dogs do, in your past? Your Honor, who are you going to believe, lie. me or this sheep? Um, they don't lie, but I did see a video on social media of a guy. He was collecting the treats from his golden retriever. Like, you can't have any of these. You can't have any of these. And while he's collecting them, the, the golden retriever puts his paw over his other paw on which one of the treats is sitting mm. so the dog covers it up like yeah and yeah. then when the when the guy moves away he he, he eats yes. it. right yes. all right 2023 is going to be a great year and 2022 has also been a great year any year you get <laughs> any year where you can look forward to the next year is a great year dr philip yeah. Yes. Oh, before we go, I just wanted to share a little bit of uh, ancient occult Jewish numerology with you oh, good. regarding the, the year. So the current year is 2022. That's 2022. Add those two, two twos up. You got a six. And if you then multiply those two twos, two times two times two, you get an eight. Eight minus six is two. Coincidence? I don't think so. <laughs> 2023, on the other hand, is a two zero and a two and a three. Take the two and the three, multiply them, then add the two. Then that gives you an eight. Take the other two and the two times the three, subtract it. Still, it's two. The, the year changed, but the result did not. What does that tell you about life? This is that is, a coincidence? This is why. It does not change. This is gematria. This is the, the secret art of Jewish numerology. Call me. I'll teach you how to do it. This is a man who almost taught Natalie Portman calculus. He came this close to teaching Natalie Portman calculus. Very close. Very close. Everybody go by today is now. This man is brilliant. Dr. Samuel Benjamin, you are, he is absolutely, you're brilliant. And how was Mary Stickmas at the comic strip? Mary Stickmas was a hit. People laughed. They learned and they laughed. What more? And they, and they cried. Did they cry <laughs> a little bit? They, they cried. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. When they got the bill. Thank you, Dr. Philip Hershenfeld. Okay, David. Thank Have you. God bless. You too. Thank Goodbye. you, Ethan Hershenfeld. God and, bless. And a happy new year to everybody. Happy new year. We are limping into 2023.
I don't want to go into specifics. It's time for the professors and Marianne. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Pele, the great Brazilian soccer star who even I knew about. We're going to be talking about the situation in Ukraine, the $1.7 trillion omnibus, omnibus bill that President Biden signed into law this week. We're going to be talking about... Governor Rick Snyder, the tale of two governors from Michigan, Rick Snyder and Gretchen Whitmer. One of them should be going to prison. Neither one of them is going to prison. And some other things with the professors and Marianne. We'll also be giving you ASMR for the eyeballs with Joe in Norway. Joe in Norway, you have a freshly seasoned wok. What are you preparing for us? Indeed, I have a... A couple hungry belly night owls here. I'm going to make them some fried ramen noodles with the tofu, paprika, shallots, mushrooms. I've also got some eggplant that I'm roasting. And then I'll make a uh, quick pickle out of these cucumbers for tomorrow. Okay. And so good? we'll come back to you. We will. Yep. This is torture. And if you have extra cash, everybody should go to Rahima.org, R-A-H-I-M-A dot org. We still haven't accepted uh, the refugees from Afghanistan, as I understand it. We create a lot of refugees here in this country. There are some who do make it here to America. Rahima.org is a great organization. It's a food pantry in the Bay Area. Go to Rahima.org, take a look at the types of food they provide to families, and uh, open up your wallet and give to Rahima.org. It's vetted by Professor Adnan Hussein. Uh, what, what, how did you discover Rahima.org, Professor Adnan Hussein? Well, uh, I didn't really discover it. It was a part of my life because my parents established it when I was um, I guess a college student, uh, maybe late high school, I forget, it was about 30 years ago, in our garage. Um, and when they discovered, particularly my mom, that there were a large number of Afghan refugees, Bosnian and Somali refugees coming to the Bay Area, um, uh, my mom started organizing a way to provide food, clothing, and other assistance that was needed to get them on their feet and established in their new home. And it grew from there and now, um, you know, feeds and supports uh, well over 500 families a month and works with other food banks and uh, charitable organizations. And they're still doing it. Um, they went today for four hours and worked at Rahima signing up renewals uh, for people who want to continue to receive assistance on a regular monthly basis uh, in 2023. And of course, there are no end of people who are uh, in need, uh, especially with inflation and all the economic hardships, um, but also the world's uh, refugees. Um, in Bay Area is extremely expensive place to live and um, people need uh, support. So do be generous if you can help out these efforts uh, to keep families afloat. Yes. Go to Rahima.org, R-A-H-I-M-A, Rahima.org. Take a look at the food that they give out. If you think your money could be better spent, I defy you to find a, a, a charity that will spend your money better because it's the basics. It's beans, it's yogurt, it's all healthy mostly vegetarian, right? Borderline vegan food. You get a pound of beans. It goes a long way. Mm. And uh, anyway, so if uh, the best way to thank everyone for this show is to go to Rahima.org, R-A-H-I-M-A.org, and uh, give uh, what you can. Professor Marianne Cummings is a particle physicist with the Fermi Lab. What she's doing here, I have no idea. Did you see Lane's drawing the other night, by the way? Of, I, oh, it, the winter scene? Oh, my God. 
That was gorgeous. That was, I saw that you commented on it. Anyway, uh, you are also, also Parks Commissioner for mm -hmm. Aurora, Illinois, originally from Michigan. Tell us the tale of two governors. There's Gretchen Whitmer, the Democrat who just got mm -hmm. reelected. And then there's the Republican Rick Snyder, who killed a lot of children in Flint, Michigan. Is that correct? He basically murdered uh, children in no, Flint? No, it wasn't children, but uh, they there were a couple dozen people died of Legionnaire's disease, which they believe was instigated from water from the pipe. Okay, well, basically... I mean, it's, lead, it's poisoning, lead poisoning, lead poisoning, lead well, poisoning is permanent. Yes, but the, but the children are permanently affected by the lead that was in the uh, that with lead what was in the water why was lead in the water because years ago the the city the emergency manager convinced flint city council that they could save money by switching the water source from the uh detroit uh water authority it's got a different name now but it was basically lake water to another source that was basically Flint River water. Now, the chemistry of, of river water is much different than the chemistry of lake water and uh, and therefore uh, was more corrosive on the pipes and some of the older pipes. You know, there's a uh, <laughs> there's a layer of protection between the old lead and the water that flows through and that got eaten away. There was uh, lead show started showing up in the drinking water of homes in Flint. Uh, children started showing uh, signs of developmental arrest. I think it was University of Virginia people came down and did a systematic study and were alarmed by the, the state of, uh, of affairs. Turns out uh, every point of the way, uh, it, it, in terms of switching a water source from one water source to another, there's a whole series of regulations that you're supposed to do. You're supposed to do testing. You're supposed to do a huge uh, a chemical assay. You're supposed to through the I believe through the Michigan uh, uh, Environmental Protection Agency do an assessment, and it turns out none of this was done. It was literally a wait and see. I am just really breezing over the details of this, but the bottom line was. Um, there was an investigation, and it started with Rick when Rick Snyder was still governor. With his uh, uh, Republican attorney general started investigating the root of this crisis and how it got so bad and how it wasn't caught. Uh, they had a credible um, prosecution worked up at the time at the end by the end of uh, Rick uh, Snyder's tenure that. Uh, were were about they were either indicted or were about to indict four members of his administration, high level members, plus which would have undoubtedly led to Rick Snyder himself. The new governor gets in, and her attorney general, I think her name is Dana Nessel. One of the first things she did was vacate all of the cases against these four claiming some there was some excuse there was well these are we feel this is weak we feel we can make a much stronger case and people were actually astonished you know because there were a lot of work that it might have been a republican ag but they were still career prosecutors and they said well if you think it's weak you can always add on charges plus you could always bring in you know federal charges because this basically falls under the purview of the Clean Water Act. So uh, the long and short of it was they said they were going to build up a case. Um, they didn't. Uh, they seemed to not act on it for a long time. They did bring cases uh, against these four, plus Rick Snyder. And the way they did it, and I, again, this is, I can't remember the details, but apparently they went through like a one judge grand jury. They they went through a legal process that was almost guaranteed that it would be overturned by the Supreme Court. And it was overturned by the Michigan Supreme Court earlier this year. And just this last week, the last of the charges that were done in, I think it was a circuit court, there were thrown out based on the earlier Supreme Court ruling, you know, it was it's almost like 
these guys set the whole thing up to fail to protect the former governor, which wouldn't be a surprise. Many of Rick Snyder's uh, campaign contributors were also Gretchen Whitmer's campaign hmm. contributors. Well, let's, mean, we have, so we have limited time here. So okay. talk to me about Gretchen Whitmer, the current Democratic governor. We were led to believe, I, was it two years ago? That there was a plot. I think that was, yeah. Yeah, a, in the lead up to the presidential election that militia members out of Michigan conspired to kidnap the governor of Michigan. You yeah. came on the show and disabused us of this notion, as did uh, Peter well, B. Collins. You know, a lot of us believed at first. I mean, I was a little concerned because this is we're talking of these these guys were members of the Wolverine Watchmen. There was a branch of the Michigan militia. Um, Michigan militia made the news because, you know, a very tangential member was Tim Timothy McVeigh, who blew up the Murrow building. Mm -hmm. um, OK, so that's how they got into the news. But, you know, as I said, a, a former mother-in-law of mine, my boyfriend's old, old boyfriend's mother, was a member of the Michigan militia, a very continental woman who happened to be a sharpshooter. And mm. she kept bitterly complaining to me about how what idiots they all were. I said, yeah. So when I heard that there was a coordinated plot to kidnap the governor, I'm going, whoa, you know, things may have evolved in the last 20 years. And, it, and then, uh, you know, so it seemed like a slam dunk case, but... I started reading, you know, some of the statements of the defense attorneys and a much different narrative emerged. Um, the um, the FBI, according to defense filings at the time, you know, deployed at least 12 informants as well as several undercover agents. There was eventually there essentially there was never any plan. There was no agreement. And of course, there wasn't a kidnapping, but they induced a lot of people to say incriminating things to get ideas in their head. Um, specifically, Barry Croft, who they described as the ringleader, even though it was the FBI guy who was doing a lot of the coordinating on Facebook and so on and so forth. A man that even the, the prosecutors admitted was a misfit outsider and had had mental health issues stemming from childhood. So you have a mentally ill guy who is being kind of goaded and encouraged, you know, with his delusional fantasies of sparking a revolution. The other guy that got sent, so he got sentenced to like 19 and, 19 and a half years. The other conspirator and by the way, there were originally there were 13. They had to let over half of them go. There were three they got on lesser charges. They ended up with four going to trial. Two of them decided to plead and be witnesses for the prosecution. And which left it, it, and there was a trial earlier this year and they were uh they were cleared on a couple of counts, and I think there was a couple of counts where there was just a hung jury, and they were retried. Hmm. And this time, they were found guilty, but of much lesser charges, and got the maximal. They weren't. They were not convicted on kidnapping and terrorism, which was the original story. Now I'm reading this, so okay, I, th this. The guy that was the ringleader got the maximal number of years. Uh, they wanted Wait, the, the FBI agent. Life when you say ringleader, when you say ringleader, the FBI agent. The guy who was the, the the guy who basically claimed to you know be plotting to kidnap. Brett had a plan to kidnap Gretchen Whitmore and got a lot of other people at the prodding of all these FBI guys. Right. You know, which even people admitted that, yeah, these people on their own, this guy on his own would have never done anything. You know, he really wasn't capable. But the other thing that was a little more disturbing was an admission from the uh, his his um, his co-conspirator, as it were, uh, this Adam Adam Fox was sentenced to 16 years and the prosecutor there, Niels um, Kessel had 
was very, uh, Kessner, excuse me, was was uh, not happy with that. And he warned, you know, this guy is going to come out a much more hardened, you know, like radical than when he came into prison. And I'm going, no shit. You're because you've effectively created a terrorist situation, a possible kidnapping. I'm, so I'm reading this and I'm thinking if I'm the governor of Michigan, this is not making me feel safe. You know, you're, you're kind of goading on a lot of people, one of them clearly mentally ill and delusional to think about kidnapping the governor. What happens if he goes rogue? If he just decides I'm not waiting for my other life, let's just go ahead and kill her or something. I mean, now something did cross my mind at that point. I thought, hmm, well, you know, the, uh, Whitmer is a very well-behaved neoliberal. I mean, she's clearly on the side of, of the corporations. She's covering for the former governor. Um, you know, she's even properly racist in the sense that, you know, she's never going to say a racist thing, but she did make public comments about how people were really tired about hearing about Flint. We have fin- Flint fatigue. Really? You know, nobody wants, yes. If people were critical of her, like, oh, yeah, well, maybe the people in Flint are a little tired you know, themselves of you know, the water situation never getting fixed. But, you know, when we were talking about Lee Harvey Oswald last week, last week and or a couple of weeks ago and and how you know the CIA he had met with the CIA and these guys knew about him and going, wow, wait a minute. You know, one of the functions of these sting operations, not only to keep budgets going to counterterrorism, but what happens if there is a governor who is very charismatic, a real leader, and is successfully doing something like, oh, seeing to it that their state goes single payer or something that, you know, disturbs the power structure that they might be a possible presidential material later on to become a real Bernie Sanders type. So you have these sting operations going on and instead of arresting people before they even move to, uh, you know, implement the plot, you wait until they do something. Well, we saw that. Is it we saw, we have to move on? I think we anyway, saw that. I think we thoughts. I think we saw that in Peru with Castillo. I, I think you had a a uh, a leftist president in Peru who, the minute he was in office, there was one sting operation after another. Let's go to Professor Anley. Thank you for that. Uh, you write a nightly update on the war in Ukraine over at the Daily Kos. Everybody should read Professor Ann Lee. Her handle is Annie Lee over at Daily Kos. Tell us what's happening in Ukraine. Well, it began this morning with uh, 120, 120 missiles uh, launched against Ukraine. Um, fortunately, about <clears throat> they estimate about 50% of them got shot down. Um, just some spectacular video. You can see some of the uh, air defense knocking down a cruise missile. Um, <clears throat> that's coming out tonight. It uh, It's pretty much the same. The... the um, Battle line is essentially frozen across the eastern and southeastern side, and uh, uh, there are a lot of peripheral stories. Most most of them are kind of interesting pieces of disinformation. Uh, there's some pressure to negotiate ceasefires, but now that we've seen a, um, the presentation of both sides' position, they're essentially the same. Um, Russia simply wants uh, Ukraine to capitulate, and Ukraine wants the uh, wants Russia to leave, all the way up to the uh, pre twenty fourteen borders. Um, essentially, that's what it's uh, come down to. And the side stories, perhaps, are more interesting relative to um, the Wagner Group uh, uh, doing all kinds of very strange things and functioning much like a punishment battalion from uh, World War II, from the Soviet period. Uh, forcing 
uh, conscripts to go um, uh, clear minefields, uh, a variety of other things, uh, threatening to shoot people who desert, etc. cetera. Uh, the peripheral stories are getting a little weirder. Uh, female prisoners in Russia are now being recruited to uh, be conscripted, which is interesting, but that's a, a very small number relative to the operation, the larger scale operation. The Russians claim that they have 300,000 troops uh, ready to go. They've waved their arms about maybe uh, invading from Belarus, but the the analysts, the dominant analysts say that that's probably not going to happen. Uh, and, and most of these are sort of empty threats. Uh, most everything is, is essentially being waged a very um, sort of uh, uh, metal level. Uh, that is, the 120 missiles that were, were sent are a reaction to five um, uh, Tu-95 bombers being uh, damaged uh, in a right on a Russian uh, air, air airstrip, uh, and it's about seventy kilometers behind the the Russian um, the battle line, the Russian border, uh, and it was uh, it made the Russians so concerned that they moved a significant number of bombers way far away. Um, so it it had an effect. They the Russian official position was that. Uh, uh, nobody got or only a few people got hurt and, and nothing was damaged. Well, there's, you know, there's video of explosions in the distance, et cetera. So all that's kind of weird. A slight possible run on cash at Russian ATM uh, um, and uh, the usual waving of arms of uh, trying to transfer military equipment from uh, various Western parties, including the United States, to uh, Ukraine. The current one is to uh, suggest that, uh, and, and if you remember the history of military procurement, the Bradley fighting vehicle uh, is a uh, kind of weird boondoggle. It originally was supposed to replace a uh, armored personnel carrier, but uh, uh, some members of the military wanted it to be a tank. Others wanted it to be more amphibious, and it, it's really a classic example of sort of overbuilding. Anyway, there are 6,000 of them in the U.S. inventory, and there's talk, this is another trial balloon, I assume, of transferring them uh, to the Ukrainians. Now, the issue, of course, and aside from all the usual disinformation, the, the current uh, framing of it is that it's, quote-unquote, a light tank. It, not, it really isn't, and its uh, performance, uh, with all due respect, uh, in the Iraqi war was uh, somewhat questionable. Um, but uh, even with that, there is in military procurement, and it is an $858 billion defense budget now, uh, is to actually – there there are um, – uh, open, there are openings for proposals for a new replacement for the Bradley fighting vehicle. So, in effect, this is simply more of the same uh, kind of procurement and uh, expanding the military industrial complex by essentially providing more business for, mm. you know, the large scale uh, pork and boondoggles and all of the things that are part of our the U.S. military. So, uh, on the one hand, it seems, uh, you know, patriotic and altruistic. On the one hand, on the other hand, it's about cash. So it's it's that, and that's sort of what's going on now. Uh, uh, many people are being killed. The, the, the Russians have been losing somewhere between 400 to 600 troops a day over the last week or so. This is It is actually a, a pretty awful uh, uh, bit of action that's going on. On a, on a battle line that hasn't really changed much of uh, from a, a few kilometers backwards and forwards, and it's very hard to spin that one way or the other. A major counteroffensive is going to come, but it's more likely going to come similarly to the original, to the origin of the war itself. That is, they're waiting for the ground to be hard enough to actually invade. Um, so that's the current thing. Other than usual uh, proclamations of brutality, um, you know, all of the usual horrible stories, um, 
and and uh, not enough uh, coverage of them. We have very little coverage of the filtration camps on the Russian side. Uh, there's tremendous claims now about uh, uh, how many uh, Ukrainians have actually gotten killed in combat, and that's uh, that has yet to be actually shown because uh, the official Ukrainian version is that only 13,000 Ukrainian troops have died when it's probably a lot more than that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, since we last talked, uh, it's over 100,000 uh, Russian uh, troops have been killed, supposedly. Um, we really don't know what the real numbers are. Although there is actually a project that has been tracking down death, uh, uh, reporting of death certificates and uh, burials. And uh, uh, the, the numbers are quite different from the actual claims on both sides by uh, the ministries of defense. So it is a kind of an open question on that relative to the war. And uh, if there's any if there's any peace talks that are going to happen, they're not going to happen until the spring. Not till spring. Every war in my lifetime was going to be over in a couple of weeks. The just like World War One, right? That's kind of part of my <laughs> lifetime. They, well, it'll be over. It's just it's going to be a quick, sweet little war. The the first war in the Gulf was a sweet, short little war that never ended. We had to go back. In 2003, there's no such thing as a sweet, a splendid little war, I think, is what Teddy Roosevelt uh, called the Spanish-American War, uh, which never ended. I mean, we never learn about what we did in the Philippines, the indigenous people, the half a million we exterminated for years after that splendid little war came to an end. Professor Adnan Hussein, do you want to talk about this resort where Russians and Ukrainians are vacationing together? Okay, well, um, I guess one of the consequences of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the war that Anne was just uh, talking about uh, is that uh, you have uh, millions of refugees, as we know, mostly Ukrainians who have gone to places like Poland and so forth, uh, but there are, of course, also Russians who have uh, been leaving the country as a result of sanctions, as a result of the new military draft, um, um, the economic uh, pressure, and uh, so on. Um, and many of them seem to have uh, located themselves to Turkey, uh, in particular to this uh, southern coastal seaside resort, um, Antalya which was popular with Russian uh, tourists uh, to begin with and already had uh, some who had relocated there as summer homes or year-round homes if they could manage it. Uh, but apparently Antalya has been inundated with um, foreign residents, including Ukrainians. So about 15,000 Ukrainians are in the city and about 50 to 60,000 Russians all in the last year. This is new migration, you might say. So they've come, many of them fleeing uh, war conditions or uh, evading authorities, including Ukrainians evading the draft. The New York Times article did interview, you know, one man um, with his daughter who um, was of military age, wouldn't give his name because, of course, it's illegal to leave Ukraine if you're a male of military age. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not just Russians who are fleeing, you know, being pressed into this war. Um, and it's very interesting because uh, there have been 19,000 sales of uh, property uh, in Antalya to foreigners. And most of these are these Russians and Ukrainians. Um, and so uh, local residents um, don't look at them really as refugees because they're buying property Apparently, it's possible for them because of Turkey's fairly generous um, residency um, laws uh, for them to gain uh, legal residency uh, and be residents. And so they don't think that after the end of this war, they're necessarily going to uh, leave um, and pointing out, why would you leave? I mean, Antalya is a gorgeous seaside resort with warm weather. weather. You know, if they've managed to spend... 
six months or a year living in Turkey and supporting themselves doing remote work or living off of previous resources, why would they relocate back to Russia? And even if they do go back to Russia or Ukraine, it's likely that they would spend significant parts of the year there. And it's changing the character of the city. Um, uh, you know, over 120,000 foreigners have, have moved there. There are whole districts of the city where you can hear Russian and Ukrainian. And in the old city, there is a historic um, St. Olypios uh, Orthodox Church that is um, patronized. It, it seems about like 60% are Russian congregants and 35 or so percent are Ukrainian. So uh, interestingly, one of the... Um, one of the Turks who was interviewed, uh, you know, about this uh, situation said that, um, look, all these Ukrainians and Russians are dancing together in the nightclubs and the cafes. Uh, this is a phony war. This is just political uh, junk. Why, why are they, you know, why is this war going on? I mean, these people, you know, have so much in common, <laughs> you know, actually, um, and um, I think there is some resentment in local residents like we're going to see throughout Europe uh, when economic pressure worsens uh, the situation that uh, the Ukrainian refugees who are welcomed with open arms in contrast to many of the refugees from the Middle East who uh, were cause for uh, panicked uh, ideas of Eurabia being established and that this being a, an invasion uh, that was meant to overwhelm Europe. Nevertheless, uh, there might be a more hostile reception if the economic situation in Europe worsens and projections of recession and high energy prices come to fruition. Although I noticed that energy prices, the natural gas in futures in Europe have dropped uh, actually to below uh, uh, invasion levels. Why is uh, so that? Why is that? Well, there's a number of factors that <clears throat> are adduced uh, to this. One, of course, uh, finding other energy sources. Uh, two, there has been some concerted attempt at uh, reduction and you know economizing on use, uh, but also it's been a warm uh, fall. So the reserves will go further into the winter because they didn't use as much of the available supply in this warm fall, but of course it could turn out to be a very severe winter. I think many of us in North America have, you know, it's been experiencing, you know, extreme sudden drops of temperature. So that's uh, speculative. One other element that actually is an interesting underside of the story, mm -hmm. I think, is that there are <clears throat> projections of less demand, partly because of recession. So, you know, the good news, oh, the prices are low, but part of the reason the prices are low is because the economy is slowing down, there's much less energy demand because people are not producing as much. So much of the energy inputs, of course, go into production, economic activity. And um, so the good news may be the bad news that, um, you know, energy is not so expensive, partly because... Um, you know, now, the is economy the, is so weak. Well, what is the story? The, the American economy is doing smashingly well, isn't it? Didn't we just have a new report that our GDP is over 3%? But Europe, not so well, right? That's right. Europe is paying the much larger economic and social price and social costs of this war because it's right on their doorstep. It also is affecting you know, uh, their energy supply, trading partners. It obviously makes sense to trade locally. I mean, it costs you less to do business with, you know, Russia for various goods that you need, like, you know, natural gas and and so on. Um, and so, yeah, Europe, uh, you know, to import, um, uh, and as also others are, are pointing out, deindustrialization. I mean, there's been a lot of relocation of uh, productive production factories to other places, including the United States. And I think there's some resentment actually among the business community, or at least the policymakers who work on the economy, that the United States is actually profiting quite a bit from the sanctions and the war circumstances. Um, and a place like Germany, um, 
that was the industrial heart of, of Europe um, is finding real depleting and relocation of many of their companies' production facilities abroad. Um, I was reading that the EU uh, initiated a windfall profit tax on America's own ExxonMobil. Mm. That's right. And ExxonMobil is challenging it, saying, well, if you if you tax us, if you take this money, we won't do any more uh, investment in finding new oil. They just mm -hmm. spent something like how much on stock buybacks? 50 billion on. They're not looking for new oil, Exxon. They're no, of course not. And and this is really, truly outrageous. It's really interesting to see the Europeans recognizing, you know, how. <laughs> <laughs> these, you know, how much they are being targeted for even modest measures to control, um, you know, these major U.S. multinational, I mean, they're multinationals, but they're based in the U.S. Um, companies, um, because part of the uh, approach with the windfall uh, tax was to be able to then redistribute some of this to lower income families that would struggle with the high costs of living and high energy prices. Okay. But since that was anticipated that there would be, and there had been spikes, you know, in the cost of energy um, earlier in the summer, uh, last spring and so on. Uh, so there, you know, the oil company is contesting, you know, this, this uh, European provision. And I don't think the Europeans are too pleased with, you know, um, the benefits that are going to the United States, the behavior of these U.S. multinationals. And perhaps that's one reason why you see um, some talk about negotiations that has been renewed. Uh, people will be getting tired of, of this uh, of this situation and also why Olaf Schultz, um, you know, is for, you know, the first uh uh, Western leader to visit China since um, the pandemic was He's Olaf the Schultz. socialist uh, leader of Germany. That's right. Yes. And I mean, I think what it's suggesting is that although most of Europe has fallen in lockstep with the U.S. position, NATO's position um, against Russia, um, that they're not as comfortable following the U.S. into the Cold War with uh, China and are concerned to keep some options open because their economies really do depend on trade with China. And uh, maybe they will start acting a little bit more independently on security, trade, and military policy, when at least when it comes to, comes to China. But it reminds me, one thing I did want to say very quickly about this um, I'm wondering also if um, Anne had seen this. I mean, Ollie North uh, was on Fox News. I happened to see this clip of him talking excuse about. Me, it's, um, it's, excuse me. Colonel Oliver North. Oh, war, that's right. War I'm criminal. So <laughs> war criminal. <laughs> Let's call him. That's right. Uh, the war criminal who actually should be behind bars. <laughs> Colonel Oliver North. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> Well, he, he was um, kind of pushing back against um, the rhetoric we heard about last week about how there are elements in the right wing that are critical of U.S. policy and support for Ukraine for various reasons, you know, whether it's polemical partisan politics or it's seeing Russia and Putin as emblems of, you know, a kind of Christian Western civilizational alliance that needs to be established as a conservative political leader, whatever the case may be. That discourse does emerge and appear sometimes in on the right in Fox News and on, on you know conservative media, and so he was pushing back against this uh, question or this idea that you know this is wasted money being sent to Ukraine. You know why should we be sending money to Ukraine when we could use it here in this country? He said, "Well, look, all this money is coming back because it's going to you know." Uh, production, it's employing Americans, good, honest, working uh, uh, class Americans, um, because they're employed in the arms industry, you know, this is all coming back to America. So don't think of it as being sent to Ukraine. It's staying in the United States. Now, what he didn't say is that it's mostly going for the profits of, you know, this wealthy uh, elite. But, you know, they believe in trickle down economics. And he's saying it trickles down to some Americans. And the second thing is he said, look, this is <clears throat> a tried and true tactic 
you know, we have to, um, you know, continue this because we have a kind of partnership that's working like it worked in Afghanistan and other places where the Ukrainians are willing to spill their blood using our bullets. So, you know, I mean, this is a, a good, you know, partnership. Uh, they're willing to fight on our behalf, you know, using our weapons. And then thirdly, that we need to warn China. This goes well beyond just the theater of NATO versus, you know, Russia. This is actually a warning sign geopolitically to China that they cannot, um, you know, take Taiwan and that there will be a heavy response. It's necessary for us to show this in this particular theater to communicate that message in the much bigger struggle that lies ahead against China. Um, he just revealed all the logic of the American current geopolitical thinking, it seems to me. Yeah. I remember in the spring of this year, Joe Biden went to Alabama uh, to a Lockheed Martin weapons manufacturing plant and, and said, I'm here to show Americans they have skin in the game in Ukraine, that this is that by making these missiles, you have skin in the game and we're creating jobs. And I thought they're not even pretending anymore. It's just out in the open. This is about profits. Well, did he get the did he get get the the workers there to decorate uh, the missiles or whatever you know they're making <laughs> right. with you know anti Putin messages right. and things like that? Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. Uh, let's turn to Professor Bick. Uh, Joe Biden, I believe, is he in the Virgin Islands? He's at some resort. Somebody's some war profiteers mansion somewhere in the Caribbean where they shipped the $1.7 trillion omnibus bill down to him f for his signature. Well, it's well-deserved, David. Uh, he, you know, he really delivered for the, um, the war profiteers. Yes, he does. Uh, yeah, he's very effective in that. So uh, last time I was here, I, I talked about the uh, $1.7 trillion omnibus uh, spending bill for 2023. And I wanted to add some some details and some perspective on uh, where that money is going. And as you have just alluded, uh, much of it is going to the military and to law enforcement. You know, when it comes to uh, spending on the military, it always seems to go up no matter which party is in control of our government. Um, Obama's last military spending bill uh, was $610 billion. Uh, Trump's final bill was uh, $740 billion. That's an increase of an, a, a staggering $130 billion. And President Biden doesn't want to uh, interrupt that uh, record. So uh, he proposed $753 billion uh, for the military. And that's an increase of $12 billion over Trump's uh, astronomical figure. So, um, and, and just to kind of put it in perspective, the CDC, the, their budget for a year is about equivalent to the increase in the, uh, the military spending that, from Trump to Biden. Mm. So... Uh, and Biden's also he's what he's basically doing is taking the money that we're saving uh, by not spending it on the Afghan war. Same amount we, of money, same exact which, amount. Yeah. He's spending that in Ukraine and, and building up uh, American arms uh, for use elsewhere. And the Democrats are claiming that the omnibus omnibus bill um, contains the highest level of non-defense funding ever. Well, now that's very interesting because uh, in reality, you have to consider what they're counting as non-defense spending. And it includes the following. Military aid programs sponsored by the State Department, nuclear weapons programs in the Department of Energy budget, Recurring post-war expenses that go to veterans' care and benefits. 
The non-defense spending also includes the Department of Justice and Department of Homeland Security, law enforcement and prison operations, and grants to state and local police. So in all, it's about $300 billion in military and law enforcement-related spending, which is not defense spending, according to the Democrats. Um, so in summary, well over $1 trillion of this $1.7 trillion bill is being spent on the military or law enforcement. Including ICE? Yes. So I'm going to get to all the different agencies that, that are included in this uh, non-defense spending. You know, they, may, they, call, they might also call it the domestic spending. Well, you know, it's really not looking out for uh, the people of this country uh, when you're spending it on uh, the drug enforcement agency. But um, and, and this is consistent with the U.S. becoming a warfare state rather than a welfare state. You know, I think the responsibility of a nation is to provide for the welfare of its people and the spending priorities of this omnibus bill, as long as many other uh, spendings by the federal government, uh, shows that this is really a secondary concern of the U.S. government, if that. Um, Department of Homeland Security Title II provisions include Customs and Border Protection, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, uh, Transportation Security Administration, Coast Guard, Secret Service, FEMA Police Grants, State and Local Law Enforcement Assistance and COPS Programs, Bureau of Prisons, Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, DEA, Marshals Service, FBI, Department of Justice National Security Division, Interagency Crime and Drug Enforcement, and the military aid portion of the additional Ukraine Supplemental Appropriations Act of 2023, and Department of Defense and Bureau of Prisons uh, spending on facilities, and State Department Title IV, which is international security assistance, as well as National Nuclear Security Administration spending. So that's, a, that's our domestic spending. Mm. Um, dropped from the omnibus bill was the revival of an expanded monthly payment for families with children. Why would we want to do that? Yeah, just because, you know, that was effective in reducing child poverty in this country by 40 percent. So rather than go for a 100 percent reduction, we're just going to eliminate the whole thing and let poverty go back to where it was for children. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's really astonishing. Um, and and also there's there's nothing in it, or virtually nothing in it for um uh, uh, you know, a new round of emergency pandemic aid, you know, as this, uh, as COVID is going up and other infections, flu and, and uh, other respiratory infections are going up and they're probably going to go up significantly after the holidays because of people getting together. But no, we're not going to spend on that. We're going to spend on all these other. Professor things. Hussein. Well, I was just going to say, why don't those kids join the military? <laughs> then they could get all of the benefits that they need and have health care. Um, unless unless know, they get wounded. And get to go to college and, you know, all of these things. I mean, basically the last vestiges of any kind of welfare state uh, resides, as I've said, I think several times before on this show, in the military. That's the last bastion of it. So, you have to basically offer yourself up to the state um, to decide whether you live or die for its purposes in order to get any benefits to have a you know, decent life for while you are alive um, and not sent off to war somewhere. Um, it's di frankly disgusting. Yes. You know, that list that uh, Prof. John read out, that's a disgusting portrayal of this country. Um, the only thing that's functioning in the economy is the, 
you know, military sector. That's the part that gets um, all of this, all of the budget. Um, and Chomsky called it military Keynesianism. And really, that's the story of post-World War II, well, World War II and the transformation. Post-World War II economy is really, you know, what distinguishes the United States is its military spending and those industries and ancillary services is really what's floating this economy. And we don't win any wars for all that money. What do we win? Granada, we won. Right? Well, we... We, we showed know, them. Saved, <laughs> saved the world uh, like once again. Hey, the Cubans could be building airstrips in America right now if... The Gipper didn't go. Well, under. at least somebody would be building. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe we need to bring in the Cubans to, for an infrastructure program. You know, Cubans building airstrips somewhere, anywhere. Hey, how about South Florida? You know, we, <laughs> and we could use the Cuban doctors as well. Yeah, <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Please continue on, on the, the omnibus bill. So that's that's the main thing I wanted to say, you know, just to call out uh, the Democratic leadership uh, once again uh, for saying, wow, you know, this is the biggest amount that we've ever spent on domestic spending. Uh, really? Uh, because we're looking at the priorities here. You know, you're, you're calling things that are military spending, not military spending, plus a whole bunch of things to uh, really oppress the population. I mean, does anyone really think we need the DEA? Well, we, is, has or, that been or a ICE. useful or ICE or ICE? Right? Have those agencies been mm. really helpful to the democracy of this country? You well, know, they're putting cruel. All these people they're in jail. Sadistic. They're sadistic, and that's important. For Sadism. Some people it is. Yeah. Okay. On the other hand. The Fox Valley Park District is getting four million dollars to fund a, a a pedestrian and bicycle bridge over the Fox River. That's good. Limiting a, mere, a major barrier to trail access. Oh, so there's that. Well, let's end. I wonder on- if it's being built strong enough to, like, you know, transport mil- military equipment over that major island. Let, let's do this. Let's uh, end on something upbeat. I'm going to ask for your favorite book, movie, TV show, and leader of the week. I can't, I can't tell you my favorite book, movie, or TV show, or leader of the year, but I can tell you my favorite book, movie, TV show, and leader in the past week. So I'll go first. My favorite book, January 6th report. Really great. Really well written. My favorite movie, Flamingo Road, Joan Crawford, TCM. Best TV show, uh, the David E. Kelly, Anatomy of a Scandal. It was good eye candy. And my favorite leader is Cori Bush, Congresswoman from Missouri. If anybody would like to add to that, that's for this week, not the year. I, mm. I, I can't think of. My favorite leader of the week is Greta Thunberg, the uh, still a teenager uh, leader of the ecology movement and uh, really changed a lot of people's lives. Well, she also proved that uh, she's pretty good at uh, Twitter clapback because uh uh, she got attacked online by Andrew. T- I don't even know who the hell Andrew Tate is. Yeah, how's He's Andrew a, Tate I, I doing? It, how's he doing tonight? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I I think they let him out of the clink, but they did arrest him. Mm-hmm. Um, apparently, Thunberg uh, was responding to, to some dickish tweet where he said, well, you know, I own a Bugatti and two Ferraris and, you know, they just crank out a ton of pollution. And so, uh, you know, you can, you know, it was just, you know, usual bragging, um, and uh, as as they might say, a certain amount of phallus waving, and so she uh, she sent him an uh, uh, an email back that uh, uh, 
Well, he said uh, he invited her, please provide your email address so I can send a complete list of my car collection. It's got 33 of them and their respective enormous emissions. And so she sends back an email saying, oh, yes, please do enlighten me. Email me, email me at smalldickenergy <laughs> at dot And so he writes back saying, thank you for confirming via your email address that you have a small penis, Greta Thunberg. Uh. The world was curious, and I do agree that you should get a life. Now, the thing is, he included a photo of himself smoking a big cigar, and he had a pizza box in front of him. Uh. The pizza box was from a chain... Uh, a pizza chain in Bucharest. So he was in Romania. So the Romanian police had a, you know, he, they suspect him of doing sex trafficking and rape along with his brother. And so by tracking that and in effect reading the QR code on the side, uh, they arrested him. So he made a rebuttal video that doxed himself and got him arrested by Romanian authorities for sex trafficking. And um, so that just happened today. Uh, so but, the, you know, what is it Twitter with pizza? Has made a lot of fun of this. What is it about pizza and Comet Pizza and QAnon and all that stuff? <laughs> what is it? Well, it's called Jer Jerry's Pizza. So I don't know why you would use uh, maybe Jerry means something else in Romanian. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> but is he out? <laughs> I, was really, uh, I think he's been uh, uh, detained for 24 hours. Hmm. All right. Uh, if anybody wants to add to best book of the week, best movie, best TV show, best leader. Well, I, I would add um, I'm, none of these are new. Uh, so since it's just the week, it's what I was. I watch Turner with. Classic Movies. So, I mean. You're, right. OK. So. <clears throat> My guess I would uh, say for a book. History of the World in Seven Cheap Things by Raj Patel and Jason uh, Moore. Fantastic book. Um, we'll be having an episode on it for Guerrilla History sometime in the new year. Um, so look for that. TV show. I did have the opportunity uh, to rewatch some episodes from Babylon Berlin, which is on um, Netflix. Amazing series. I just absolutely think it's one of the best things I've seen in years. Babylon um, Berlin. Babylon Berlin. It's set in, you know, basically Weimar, uh, late Weimar um, uh, Berlin and uh, involves a detective um, it's a really interesting portrait of the intellectual, cultural and political world in which fascism is starting to rise uh, and emerge. Really great, great series. OK. Um, Leader of the week, Lula. Yes. Uh, because he's appointed um, a new minister for um, a minister for a new ministry of indigenous affairs and an environmental minister who will hopefully rebuild uh, that ministry that Bolsonaro destroyed and give the lungs of the world a chance to breathe the yeah. Amazon. Great. If anybody would like to add to that, we can go to Joe, Joe in Norway. You're torturing me, Joe. Last week was easy. <laughs> you didn't make me hungry polishing your wok. At least I, I made a I little... Uh, Little belated Christmas festive dish here. What We've is got, that? Uh, grilled eggplant with tahini sauce, uh, balsamic reduction, and uh, pomegranate and mint. Got all the nice colors, greens and browns. Excellent and presentation. And then I did a quick stir fry noodles, ramen noodle dish with tofu, mushroom, celery. Wow. And then a quick pickle, the garlic and, uh, what is it, shallots. Amazing. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this food and I'm starving. And then I'm thinking, all I have to do is walk over into my kitchen, step over a couple of mice and open <laughs> the, the refrigerator and eat over the, uh, the sink. There are people mm -hmm. in America, Joe who are starving and uh, give to Rahima.org, R-A-H-I-M-A 
dot org. That is the official charity of, uh, I don't know if that's the right word to use, the official food bank here. And it, uh, the, the food you're looking at, uh, a lot of bang for the buck. It's not that expensive, and it goes a long way, and that's the kind of food they give out at Rahima.org. Beans and tofu and rice with fiber in it um, and fruit. And you can get, uh, you can feed a lot of people uh, for not a lot of money if uh, you hand out that type of food. So your money is well spent. If you give to Rahima dot org r a h i m a dot org send them whatever you can it's been vetted by professor adnan hussein his parents set it up and you know if his parents the people who gave us uh professor adnan hussein uh they they you know they're doing something right so give to rahima dot org let's end this year by sending them uh, money. We create a lot of refugees in this world. It's time to take them in and uh, help them. Any final thoughts before we... Well, I was thinking about television. I'm a little, a little behind on my television watching, but I, I do recommend Professor John's Star Trek on Saturdays during office hours. Yes. I have been enjoying that. In so, spite of... Captain Kirk. Office hours, Friday night, 8 p.m. And then uh, it goes through till the, the afternoon where Professor John, will be, Professor John teaches the Twilight Zone Friday night and Saturday he teaches Star Trek. And Professor Hussein? Oh, just quickly, we didn't talk about Pele and I don't want to do anything oh, right, right, wrong, right, right. but just... Yeah. Just to say that um, he was a global uh, superstar, you know, one of the first real global celebrity athletes um, to captivate the world. He did it um, by playing in World Cups, uh, particularly the first televised, uh, globally televised by satellite color transmission. You know, a beautiful athletic black man in this amazing canary yellow uh, framed with cobalt blue shorts. I mean, it was just visually arresting image. And he's, you know, really important just um, as a major global black athlete, the first really of his kind and really maybe only eclipsed or matched by Muhammad Ali for, um, you know, notoriety and, and being so beloved and ador adored globally. So he came from <clears throat> incredibly poor roots, shining shoes um, at age seven um, in a slum in Brazil, um, was discovered uh, for the footballing genius that he was, captivated the world on the global stage at the World Cup. We just had a World Cup happening in Qatar in 2022. Five billion people watched it. And um, that's the kind of superstar that he was. And so he will be remembered and, and missed. Uh, he turned into a bit of a corporate pitch man, which maybe you can understand. He, you know, came from nothing and he wanted to support his, his family and so on. Uh, but what I will remember is um, the beauty uh, mm -hmm. of his, of his goals. And also the five years that he played in New York for the That's New York right. cosmos That's and right. really made, you know, soccer exciting and fun for this period in the seventies in the United States. When I was a boy, it was right. amazing that Pele was, was on our television screens um, right. in the U S. Right. Great. Professor Adnan Hussein is chairman of the religion department at Queens university in Kingston, Ontario. He is the co-host of Guerrilla History with the beloved Henry Huckamacki. Uh, Professor Ann Lee writes over the Daily Kos, read her every night. And that's when she puts out her Ukraine update. And uh, but she writes about other things as well. She writes under the name Annie Lee. Follow Professor Marianne Cummings on Twitter at Razor Girl. And Professor Jonathan Bick will be teaching The Twilight Zone every Friday night at office hours and the Star Trek on Saturday. 
And Professor Hussein's course on the Crusades is available for everybody. And it resumes on the 9th or the 8th? 7th, uh, the 7th. Saturday the 7th. The best way to start your weekend is to sit in on Professor Hussein's class on the Crusades. It, it's just a great way uh, to relax and learn. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see everybody. Thank you. And thank you for a great year.